In this video, we're going to look at upper and lower bounds. To be able to do this topic, you need to be really good at error intervals. So you may want to check out my video on error intervals first. I'll put a link to that in this video's description. Imagine we had a rectangle that was 20 centimeters by eight centimeters. You could find its area by multiplying 20 by eight, which gives you 160 centimeters squared. But what if I now told you that 20 centimeters wasn't actually necessarily 20 exactly? I'd rounded it to the nearest 10. And for the eight centimeters, it wasn't necessarily exactly eight, I'd rounded it to the nearest centimeter. What would be the maximum and minimum possible area for this rectangle? To answer this question, we're going to write down error intervals for the length and the width. Let's start with the length. That's 20 centimeters, so if we draw a number line and put 20 in the middle, this has been rounded to the nearest 10 centimeters. So if we go 10 centimeters below, that's 10. 10 centimeters above, that's 30. The upper and lower bounds for the error interval will just be halfway in between these. So the lower bound is at 15 and the upper bound is at 25. So we could write down an error interval for the length, which must be in between 15 and 25. But of course it can't be equal to 25 and that's why we use that less than symbol. Now if we do the same thing for the width for eight centimeters, we can put eight in the middle. This one's been rounded to the nearest centimeter, so let's go one centimeter below and one centimeter above. And then halfway in between these will form our error interval. So halfway in between seven and eight is 7.5 and between eight and nine is 8.5. So we can write down an error interval for the width. That's in between 7.5 and 8.5. Now we're going to take these two error intervals and use them to work out the maximum and minimum possible areas for this rectangle. So let's start with the minimum area. The minimum area must be the minimum length multiplied by the minimum width. And if you multiply these two together, you get 112.5 centimeters squared. So this is the lowest possible area for that rectangle. To do the maximum possible area, you take the maximum length, so 25, and multiply this by the maximum width, 8.5. And that gives you 212.5 centimeters squared. Now that we know the minimum and maximum possible areas, we could write these two in an error interval for the area itself. So the area must be in between 112.5 and 212.5. We call this lower one the lower bound, and this upper one here the upper bound. What's really important when you approach a question like this is that you work out the error intervals for the length and the width first and then multiply those. Some people may multiply 20 by eight and get 160 and then try and work out the error interval for this, but that's not the way you do these types of questions. Let's have a look at a second one. So two teams are going to play a football match. There are 26,000 home supporters, but this is to two significant figures. And there are 3,500 away supporters, that's also to two significant figures. And the question we've been asked is, work out the upper bound and the lower bound for the total number of supporters. So to find the total number of supporters, we would usually just add these two numbers together. But before we add them, we're going to work out their own error intervals. So let's start with the home supporters. There are 26,000 to two significant figures. So let's work out an error interval for this. So 26,000 goes in the middle. The number that's below this to two significant figures is 25,000 and above is 27,000. So halfway in between these, we have 25,500 and 26,500. So this forms the error interval for the home supporters. It's in between those two numbers. Now let's do the same for the away supporters. So this one's 3,500, and it's also to two significant figures. So below that would be 3,400, and above 3,600. Halfway in between these, we get 3,450 and 3,550. So this forms the error interval for the away supporters. So if we now take these two error intervals, and we've been asked to work out the upper bound and the lower bound for the total number of supporters. To work out the total number of supporters, you would add the number of supporters for home and away together. So if we're going to work out the upper bound, we would add the upper bound for the home supporters, 26,500, and the upper bound for the away supporters, 3,550, and get 30,000 at 50. And then for the lower bound, we would do the lower bound of the home supporters, so 25,500, and we'd add to this the lower bound of the away supporters, 3,450, and this gives you a lower bound of 28,950. Since the questions just asked for the upper and lower bound, we don't need to write this as an error interval. We finished this part of the question. Now a second part of this question might say, at half time, 2000 supporters to one significant figure leave the match. And then we need to work out the upper and lower bounds for the number of supporters still at the match. Now we already know the upper and lower bounds for the total number of supporters at the match. The total is in between 28,950 and 30,050. But what about the 2,000 supporters to one significant figure that are going to leave the match? So the supporters that are going to leave must be in between 1,500 and 2,500. 
we've been asked to work out the upper and lower bounds for the number of supporters still at the match. So here we're going to do a subtraction, the total amount, subtract the number that leave. So if we start with the upper bound, your first instincts will probably be to do the upper bound for the total, subtract the upper bound for those that leave. 30,500, subtract 2,500, which gives you 27,550. But for a subtraction, this is actually incorrect. If we want to work out the maximum number of people that are still at the match, we want to start with the maximum amount of supporters, so 30,050, but we want the lowest amount of supporters to actually leave. So we don't want to use the upper bound for those that leave, we want to use the lower bound at 1,500. This is because if you do a large number, subtract a small number, you end up with a large answer still. So if we subtract a smaller amount, like 1,500, we'll end up with a bigger answer. So the upper bound is 28,550. Now we need to think in a similar way for the lower bound. If we want to work out the lowest amount of people still at the match, we want to start with the lowest amount of supporters in total, so 28,950, but we want the maximum amount to leave, so 2,500. So to work out the lower bound for the number of supporters still at the match, we do 28,950, subtract 2,500. And this gives you a lower bound of 26,450. The lesson here is that when you do subtractions, you need to be really careful. If you're going to do the upper bound with a subtraction, you do the upper bound, subtract the lower bound. And if you're going to do the lower bound, you do the lower bound, subtract an upper bound. And this is really similar for division as well. Let's summarize all of this in a table. So let's say we had two numbers, we'll call them A and B, and we had the error intervals for them, the lower bound of A, which we're just going to call LA, and the upper bound of A, which is going to be UA, and then the lower bound of B, and the upper bound of B. Let's have a look at what would happen to the bounds if we added, subtracted, multiplied, and divided these. So if we start with A plus B, and we want to find the upper bound and the lower bound. This is a bit like when we worked out the total number of supporters. We did the upper bound of A, which was the home supporters, and we added to this the upper bound of B, which was the away supporters. And to do the lower bound, you just add the lower bounds. So the lower bound of A plus the lower bound of B. Next, what about if you did A multiplied by B? Now this is a bit like when we did the area of the rectangle. To find the upper bound, we did the upper bound of the length, and we multiplied this by the upper bound of the width. And for the lower bound, it was just the lower bound multiplied by the lower bound. So whenever you're adding or multiplying things, to find the upper and lower bounds is fairly straightforward. It's when you're going to subtract and divide you have to be careful. So if we were going to do A subtract B, and we wanted to find the upper bound, we would do the upper bound of A, so start with the biggest number, and subtract from that the lower bound of B. So take away a smaller number as possible. If we were going to do the lower bound though, then we need to start with the smallest number possible, so the lower bound of A, and then we would subtract from this as much as possible, so we'd subtract the upper bound of B. As mentioned already, it's very similar for division. So if we were going to do A divide by B, to make this as big as possible and find the upper bound, you want to start with the biggest possible number, so the upper bound of A. But to keep the answer as big as possible, you divide it by a small number. The smallest possible number would be the lower bound of B. And then to make a division as small as possible, you start with the smallest number, so the lower bound of A, and then you divide this by the biggest possible number, so the upper bound of B. Now let's have a look at a few more questions. So in this question, we're going to say a car travels 240 miles, but that's to two significant figures, and it's going to take five hours, and that's to the nearest hour. Then we're told the speed limit for all of the roads on the journey was 40 miles per hour, and it says by considering bounds, show that the driver must have broken the speed limit. So as always in these questions, we're first of all going to write down the error intervals for the information we're given. Let's start with the 240 miles to two significant figures. So if we put 240 in the middle, the number that's at two significant figures immediately below this is 230, and above is 250. The error interval will be halfway in between those, so 235 up to 245. So the error interval for the distance is in between 235 and 245. Now let's do the same for the five hours. So let's put five hours in the middle, and this is to the nearest hour. So one hour below is four, and one hour above is six. The error interval will be halfway in between these, so at 4.5 and 5.5. So the error interval for the time is in between 4.5 and 5.5 hours. Now let's take those two error intervals and consider what we need to do next. Now we're told here that the car must have been speeding, so we need to work out the error interval for the speed. To work out an average speed, you would do the distance and then divide this by the time. So we're going to need to do a division. Remember from the table before, when we do divisions, we need to be a little bit careful. So let's start by trying to work out the upper bound for the speed. 
To do this, we're going to do the upper bound of the distance, so 245, but we're going to divide by the lower bound of the time, since it's a division. So 245 divide by 4.5, which gives us 54.4 recurring miles per hour. So we can add the upper bound to the error interval, it's 54.4 recurring. Now if we do the lower bound, this time we need to do the lower bound of the distance, 235, divided by the upper bound of the time, so 5.5. So 235 divided by 5.5 gives you 42.7 miles per hour. So we can add the lower bound in at 42.7. So the lowest possible average speed of this car is 42.7 miles per hour. But we were told in the question the speed limit of all of the roads was 40 miles per hour. So it could be the case that the driver was driving 42.7 miles an hour at a constant speed for the whole journey, or their speed may have gone above this at certain times. Either way, the driver must have been speeding. So we could say the driver must have driven more than 40 miles per hour, as 42.7 is greater than 40. It's quite common for upper and lower bounds questions in exams to feature algebra. Let's have a look at a few examples of this. So we're going to start with this formula here, a equals 3b minus c. And we're going to have some values for b and c. b is 8.7, and that's the one decimal place, and c is 15 to the nearest integer. And we're going to be asked to work out the upper and lower bounds for a. To start a question like this, we're going to write down the error intervals for b and c first. So let's start with b, which is 8.7 to one decimal place. So the error interval for b must be in between 8.65 and 8.75. Now we do the same for c, so c was 15 to the nearest integer, so c must be in between 14.5 and 15.5. Now we turn our attention to the formula. a equals 3b minus c. So we have a subtraction here, and remember subtractions are ones you need to be careful with. Let's start with the upper bound. So when we do the upper bound of a subtraction, we want to start with the greatest possible number and take away from that the lowest possible number. So we want the upper bound of 3b and subtract from that the lower bound of c. So to do the upper bound of 3b, we do 3 multiplied by the upper bound of b, which is 8.75. Next we need to subtract from this the lower bound of c, and that's 14.5. You can stick this into your calculator and it'll give you this number here. Now for the lower bound. So for the lower bound of a subtraction, we want to start with the smallest amount, so the lower bound of 3b, and take away as much as possible, so the upper bound of c. So we do the lower bound of 3b, so 3 lots of 8.65, and subtract from this the upper bound of c, so 15.5. Type this into your calculator and you get 1045 so the upper bound is 11.75, the lower bound is 10.45, and we finish this question. Let's try a second one. So this time we have a more complicated formula, m squared plus h over p, and we've got values for m, also for h, and also for p. And the question will ask us to work out the upper and lower bounds for y. So again we're going to start by writing the error intervals for all of the information given. Let's start with m. So m is 3.3 to one decimal place, so that's in between 3.25 and 3.35. Then on to h, 7.9 also to one decimal place, so h must be in between 7.85 and 7.95. And finally p, now this one's to two decimal places, so p must be in between 0 0.205 and 0 0.215. Now we can look at the formula, so it's y equals m squared plus h over p. Here we have a division, we've got the top of the fraction, divide the bottom of the fraction. Remember again, divisions are those tricky ones where we need to be careful. Let's start with the upper bound. So to do the upper bound of a division, you want the upper bound of what's on the top of the fraction divide by the lower bound of what's on the bottom of the fraction. So we want to make m squared plus h as big as possible and p as small as possible. So we're going to take the upper bound of m and h and the lower bound of p. So the upper bound of m squared is 3.35 squared, and then we add to this the upper bound of h, so 7.95, and divide this by the lower bound of p, so 0 0.205. Again, we'll need a calculator for this, and it gives you this number here. Now onto the lower bound. So this time we want the top of the fraction to be as small as possible, but the bottom of the fraction, the thing we're dividing by, to be as big as possible. This will give us the smallest possible answer. So we use the lower bound of m and h, and the upper bound of p. So if we do the lower bound of m, 3.25, and then squared, add to this the lower bound of h, so 7.85, but divide this by the upper bound of p, so 0.215. Type this into your calculator and you get this number here. Now we're going to look at one more question that's algebraic. We've got this formula here and we've got values for t, for v, and for n. Now sometimes the wording of the question can be a little bit different to those previous ones, especially on Edexcel papers. 
So it might say, by considering bounds, work out k to a suitable degree of accuracy. We're going to start this question in the same way as we did the previous ones. We're going to find the upper and lower bound, but the way we finish the question will be a bit different. Let's start by working out the error intervals for all of the information we've been given. So t first of all at 14.8. That means t must be in between 14.75 and 14.85. Then v, that's 4.7. That's in between 4.65 and 4.75. And finally, n to two decimal places, 1.915 and 1.925. Then we look at the formula for k, and we're going to start with the upper bound. Now there's a square root on this one, but that doesn't really change our approach. We're just going to need to square root in there. But we do have a fraction again, and a subtraction, so we need to be really careful with this one. So in this question, we have a fraction, which is a division. When you're doing the upper bound for a division, you want the top to be as big as possible, so we're definitely going to want to use the upper bound for t, but we want the bottom to be as small as possible. Now the bottom is a subtraction. To make a subtraction as small as possible, you want to start with the smallest possible number and subtract from it the biggest possible number. So to make the bottom of the fraction as small as possible, we want to use the lower bound of v and the upper bound of n. It's almost like we have a question within a question on this one. So we're going to do the square root of, on the top we want to make t as big as possible, so the upper bound of t, 14.85, and then we're going to divide this, and we want to make the bottom as small as possible, so we're going to start with a small number for v, so the lower bound, 4.65, but take away as much as possible from this, so the upper bound of n at 1.925. Type this into your calculator and you get this number here. Now if we look at the lower bound, this is just going to be the reverse of all of those, so where we use the upper bound, we use the lower bound. So let's start with the square root. This time on the top, we want 14.75, the lower bound of t. And on the bottom, we want to make the bottom as big as possible. So we start with the biggest number for v, 4.75, but we take away as little as possible from it, 1.915. Type this into your calculator and you get this number here. Now remember the wording of this question was a little bit different. Let's return to where it says a suitable degree of accuracy. So this time we actually need to pick a value for k and it needs to be a suitable value. To decide what value you need to pick, you look at the upper bound and the lower bound, and we try and find a number that they would both round to. So if we were to round both of these to the nearest integer, the upper bound would give us two, and the lower bound would also give us two. So this does agree, and it's a possible answer, but can we do any better? What if we round it to one decimal place? The upper bound would be 2.3, and the lower bound would also be 2.3. So they also agree, so that's a possible answer. Can we do better than that? What about two decimal places? The upper bound will be 2.33, and the lower bound will be 2.28. So they no longer agree, so that's not a suitable answer. So if we go back to one decimal place, that's the best we can do. So we would say that the answer for k, a suitable value, is 2.3. And to explain this, we would say, as the bounds both agree, when they're rounded to one decimal place. Thank you for watching this video, I hope you found it useful. Check out the one I think you should watch next, subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos, and go and check out the exam questions I've put in this video's description.